Welcome everyone to the first national week of injection molding. Um, next year, I promise we'll have t-shirts, banners, stickers. Um, maybe not. You can make your own. I don't know. Maybe I'll get to doing that with plastic. Um, I'm Lindsay Nebel. For those of you who don't know me, I am on the injection molding board and I am the chair of this national week of injection molding. Uh, today, we have a really cool day. Um, it's kind of an introduction to injection molding. And what I'm most looking forward to, uh, no offense to Brad Johnson, because technically I already did the intro with Brad Johnson when I was a Penn State student uh, in the plastics department. And, um, but we have Tim Oswald this morning. He is going to do the history of injection molding. I had the awesome opportunity um, to interview him for plastics a couple weeks ago or a month ago. Time is elusive. And uh, it was really cool. And I'll get to his introduction in a second. If you're going to stick around with us for the rest of the week, we have uh, tomorrow is a full day of simulation talks. We have Autodesk, Beaumont, a um, uh, bunch of cool stuff there. Wednesday, we are actually um, going to reissue the empowered processing talks that were given um, 2021. Those have some really cool topics going on. Thursday is troubleshooting. We have um, Madison Group and a couple others, um, uh, retired uh, Motorola. And then we have a really great troubleshooting in injection molding roundtable. That's going to be with um, Eric Bowersox, Eric Larson, Todd Bryant, and Jeff Jansen. Uh, you definitely don't want to miss it. We've got really great topics lined up in that conversation and stuff maybe you don't think about when you think about injection molding, when you think about troubleshooting, kind it all together in a really nice uh, little round table. And then Friday, we're going to re-release some of our Antec proceedings. So feel free to check those out. There's um, some great topics on that. Um, and But back to today. Today is the introduction and the history of injection molding. And like I mentioned earlier, we have Tim Oswald, who is a professor of mechanical engineering and the director of the Polymer Engineering Center at University of Wisconsin-Madison. Um, he has his bachelor's and master's in mechanical from South Dakota School of Mines and Technology and his PhD in mechanical engineering from the University of Illinois um, in the field of polymer processing. He has uh, spent a lot of time in Germany um, at the Institute for Plastics Processing in Aachen. Um, he has won uh, just numerous awards, uh, National Science Foundation Presidential Young Invent Investigator Award, um, Honorary Professor at the University of Erlangen, Nuremberg in Germany, um, Honorary Professor at National University of Columbia. Um, he does a lot with the polymer and polymer composites processing and designing. Um, he has published over 300 papers, um, many books. Uh, he's a series editor for six different books, uh, editor for polymer engineering, journals, um, serves on the scientific advisory board for several industries, is one of the co-founders of the Madison Group um, and on the commission to create a science ministry in Columbia. So, and... My favorite title for uh, Tim is the self-claimed historian of the plastics industry. Um, and so as you can tell, a lot of free time on his hands. Um, so we are really grateful uh, that you're here this morning. So good morning. Good morning, uh, Lindsay. And thanks for the kind introduction. And uh, actually, thanks for inviting me today to um, one of my favorite uh, topics and that is uh, history of science and history of engineering. In this case, here is history of injection molding, um, which is, uh, I mean, kind of a, a I think that would take a, a few days to actually do, do completely do it justice. Uh, I'm also the KK and Cindy Wang professor uh, of mechanical engineering. And of course, uh, I will mention KK Wang uh, during my presentation as he was one of the key people 
to get uh, injection molding simulation uh, on the road uh, in the 1970s. And I'll talk a little bit about that as well. And I, I'm happy that there will be some presentations on injection molding so that, uh, simulation. So this may be just a little bit of a historical background. And so look, and, and it's hard, right? I mean, how do you present something in, in the history of injection molding without giving a little bit of, of a background? Uh, so of course, we all know that this year in, in, in October will be the K show in Germany, which has been uh, historically one of the largest um, uh, plastics shows um, in the world. And I've actually made it to all the K shows uh, in the past uh, 33 uh, years, uh, except for one year that I didn't didn't go. So I've been, I've been I think I've been to 11 uh, K shows uh, so far. And so, and let me go back to, an, to a K show in, in 1998. Uh, so I took these photographs. It was rainy, rainy day when we walked in. Uh, <clears throat> the uh, K show in 1998 uh, <clears throat> promised a lot. It was the Arburg was celebrating its 75th uh, anniversary. Uh, the previous uh, K show, it was really exciting uh, to see the Cincinnati Millicron Electra, uh, which was um, an electric um, injection molding machine. That year, there were going to be new electric machines, ele electric, mach full electric injection molding machines were becoming uh, quite uh, important. And they've actually gained a lot of importance, particularly <clears throat> because of lower energy consumption in places. Uh, where energy um, is a problem and water is a problem, et cetera, like in the Gurayad uh, region in India, which, which has a very fast growing plastics industry, uh, <clears throat> their uh, low energy consuming machines uh, are important. And I think that's going to be a thing in the future is energy efficiency, et cetera. So there are many things to come. But interestingly enough, the most memorable thing at the K show is 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 a old man. His name was Ulrich Kölsch. Uh, he approached me. Uh, he had read some of my uh, uh, books, um, uh, two of them actually. Uh, I had two of them at the time, uh, and he knew saw there that I was interested in the history of plastics. And he said, "Look, you, uh, I actually have a collection of plastics uh, uh, artifacts. Are you interested in seeing?" them and I said uh, sure and so so uh, one afternoon we made an appointment in his at their house in Essen uh, on on the Ursula street so and there he introduced me to his wife Ursula Kirch uh, and what and they showed me what happened to be the largest collection of plastics artifacts uh, <clears throat> in the world thousands and thousands of plastic artifacts going way <clears throat> into the early, uh, 1800s of different resins uh, that, that that were used to make uh, parts that could be molten and made in, 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 into parts. Um, <clears throat> and I kept a relation with uh, with both Ursula and Ulrich. Also, or Ursula passed away a few years later, and I visited um, uh, Ulrich uh, several times times at his at his place in um, in in um, in Essen later he moved part of his collection uh, to southern Germany and now part of his collection resides uh, at the museum in Düsseldorf so I, I encourage for those of you who are going to go to the K show uh, to to go see the the the, the plastics museum in Düsseldorf where many 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 of uh, of uh, the Kirch collection is there I mean here in the foreground you see this beautiful Fada radio uh, uh, made of of Phenolics and um, injection molded um, or transfer molded uh, out, out of uh, phen phenolics. Uh, one of those radios today, if you find one in one of your flea markets somewhere in your town, I mean, you'll recognize it right away. Well, that's probably worth $5,000 or so. So um, these are very priced uh, um, uh, artifacts. Uh, other things that you could see, you could see acrylic parts in their collection, uh, cellulose, uh, casein, and many, many more. And so with cellulose, it's very interesting. So that little box on the right-hand side is actually a thermoform cellulose box. So they took cellulose sheets mixed with mother of pearl and thermoformed them and then made these inlays and um, into it. I mean, beautiful, beautiful uh, uh, artifacts. But with cellulose, uh, that's that's really where the story of injection molding uh, starts. And there's a lot of misconceptions. Who was the inventor of cellulose? The British, of course, claimed that it was Parks. Uh, here in the States, 
um, often we, 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 we say that uh, John Wesley Hyatt uh, was the inventor of cellulose, but this story is, is, is more complex than that. Uh, the story really starts uh, in 1845 uh, when Christian Friedrich Schönbein, who was a German chemist and um, had actually also studied in Erlangen, the university where I hold the honorary professorship. Uh, and at that time, he was a, a professor at the Polytechnic uh, Institute in Zurich, which became the ETH, which is a huge, beautiful university, a very, very uh, uh, well-known uh, technical university now. So he was a professor there. Research wasn't really a thing that was done in the polytechnic institutes. And so he did a lot of his research at home. Um, and one of the things he was researching with was uh, nitric acid, nitric acid and sulfuric acid. Uh, and he did his research and his mixing and everything in, in, in the kitchen in his house. And one day um, he was doing a, his work with nitric acid and the bottle of nitric acid tipped over. And so he very quickly picked it up and the, the nitric acid was on the, on the wooden counter of his, of his kitchen. So he took his grabbed from behind him his wife's apron that was hanging over the stove uh, and wiped it off. And then he realized he committed a big mistake wiping um, nitric acid uh, with, with the beautiful white apron cotton apron of his wife. Then he very quickly put water on it, trying to wash the nitric um, acid off. Uh, and then he, he hung the, um, the apron behind him over the stove again, and he continued working. And a couple of minutes later, uh, there was this huge explosion behind him. And he looked and there was only a white cloud uh, where the apron used to be. So the apron had exploded. Uh, so he had invented uh, nitrocellulose, um, 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 uh, so uh, it's an explosive uh, material like nitroglycerin, uh, and he named it gun cotton. Uh, he tried to play around with it to try to make uh, explosives to use it in guns. In fact, he even sold his patent to the Austrian army. Uh, but the nitrocellulose was much too volatile and the explosions were much more potent than regular gunpowder. Um, such that uh, cannons and guns uh, would uh, backfire, which is not a very comfortable thing if you're standing behind uh, one of these uh, cannons or, 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 or guns. And so eventually it sort of dwindled off. But he continued playing with this material. It was interesting because you mix the, the cellulose with the nitric acid and, and it created this mass that when heated and heated carefully would soften uh, and then could be shaped. So he basically had invented the first thermoplastic. You can see kind of the, the reaction there on the right-hand side of the, uh, of, of, of the graph. And he also then found if you added plasticized like camphor or other materials, it would soften it. And, he, and at one point he cut his finger and he actually put a, a little bit of this material over his finger and it stopped the bleeding, uh, and it, which was really a tiny film of, of, uh, nit uh, of uh, nitrocellulose. So he had basically invented the first uh, Band-Aid and he actually patented that as well. And so eventually he got bored with it. He sold his patents uh, to Alexander Parks and Alexander Parks continued working uh, with um, with this material, he renamed it uh, uh, and he called it Park Sign. Uh, and uh, he played and played with it until he thought he had the right uh, mixtures and everything. And so he was able then to exhibit it in the 1865 uh, World Expo in London. That was the World Expo when, when Queen Victoria arrived in her carriage and her carriage was different than all the other carriages because it had a hard rubber over the wheels to make her ride a little smoother. So those were the first uh, solid rubber tires uh, that existed in the world, vulcanized rubber tires. So that was one other thing that is important of that World Expo. And he exhibited things that you can see there, buttons, uh, decorative things, Bible covers, uh, picture frames, etc. But there was one big problem with park sign. And that's why he hadn't quite gotten it down yet. And so a lot of the, the mixtures were not, were not very uh, evenly distributed. So the mi mixing quality wasn't uh, as good as it should be. And so the parts, so the excess camphor would evaporate out, uh, which would cause the part to shrink in that region. And so if you have differential shrinkage, you have warpage. Uh, and as I tell my students, uh, if anything is going to go wrong with your new product is warpage. Warpage has killed many, 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 many projects and many products and many materials. So warpage still remains to this date, probably one of the biggest headaches. 
And he tried and tried and tried to fix it. He eventually sold his 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 patents to uh, someone else. They renamed they, they renamed the, the the material, but it just really <clears throat> they they couldn't get it to work. And, and so around that same time, 1865, um, um, a, a man named John Wesley Hyatt, an American um, uh, who had been watching uh, all these new materials, um, saw this article in the newspaper uh, from, a, uh, from a company called Fallon and Colander. Fallon and Colander was the biggest billiard ball manufacturer in the world. And they, and, and they were advertising for someone to find a replacement for ivory to make billiard balls. Well, billiard was one of the, the biggest uh, entertainments of the time. And, and in order to produce billiard balls, they actually had to slaughter elephants and all around the world. So every year to supply the, the world supply of billiard balls, they were actually uh, uh, slaughtering about 70,000 elephants. And so they saw the writing on the wall. They said, well, soon there's not gonna be any elephants left. So we need somehow a synthetic uh, replacement uh, for ivory. And um, and John Wesley Hyatt, he had seen Park Sign. He says, "Well, I can play around with Park Sign. That kind of looks like ivory. You could definitely color it in different different colors." And so he played around, and he found that sweet spot where there was just perfect mixing, perfect plasticizer, and everything. And he actually had now a, a material that was a little bit lighter. Uh, than ivory, but he could add some calcium carbonate and all of that to make it about the same density. And so he had a replacement uh, for ivory. He didn't cash in in his $10,000. He decided to go in business on his own. And that was the beginning of the thermoplastics industry. And one replacement that, 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 that I found, I found a replacement for, for uh, a gutta percha or hard rubber uh, or a cis or uh, one for uh, polyisoprene that was used to make dentures. Everybody at the time had dentures. Everybody had rotten teeth at the time. That was before they had um, they had fluorine in the water. People hardly brushed their teeth. So by the time you were in your twenties, you kind of had <clears throat> either no teeth or rotten teeth. And so dentures was a big thing. And that rubber industry made dentures out of out of hard, hard rubber. But now you had a beautiful material that could be that could be you could add dyes to it, so you could have pink gums and white teeth and all of that. And so the the rubber industry thought, well, you know, it's going to be <clears throat> uh, there's going to be a big competition for us, and so they wanted to do counter uh, propaganda against uh, against uh, celluloid or cell, uh, cellulose nitrate. And so they said, you know, this material is actually explosive. So if your soup is too hot, or if you smoke a cigar or a pipe. Uh, you you risk of having the dentures blow up in your in your mouth, and so they had drawings of people without a chin and other things in the newspapers. Obviously, it was false advertisement, <clears throat> but it was um, but 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 it did help back uh, the, the industry. People were then afraid of of, of wearing uh, cellulose dentures. Even to to compound that, sometimes when two billiard balls collided in in bars, they let off a little explosion, a little black spot on the billiard ball result, and that was also just because of the explosive nature uh, of cellulose. So people thought people were, uh, were shooting guns or something. That was just two billiard balls colliding sometimes. So people were afraid. It set back the dental industry. 1860s, late 1860s to the 90s, people didn't didn't wear any cellulose dentures because of that, and that created Created two completely separate industries. That's where they split, and and the, so there's the rubber industry and there's the plastics industry, and they basically haven't smiled uh, at each other uh, since then. Now the plastics industry started growing. This is just a, a, a drawing uh, of uh, in Newark, New Jersey. That's a celluloid company. That's the one that uh, John Wesley Hyatt um, started. And so now they needed to process this material. I already mentioned you can make sheets and thermoform them and you, you can cut things out and you can bend them with heat and all of that. Uh, but now they also wanted to make more complex parts uh, and, and be able to pour this material or cast it uh, into, into um, a very complex hollow metal molds. And so they started working on it and they basically patented in 1872, the first injection molding machine. That was the first injection molding machine. If we can see on the, on the left-hand side is a larger picture. You can see a cylinder 
I don't know if you see my my um, my mouse. So this is a cylinder piston. This is a hollow cylinder. You pour the material in here. This is a heated. There is there is um, uh, heating and uh, going on here in this section. Once the material is molten, then you the piston comes down. There's still this this um, converting cylinder. So there are all these pins that help conduct the heat uh, to melt the material. The material is then by the piston push through this hole through this is what's called the discharge nozzle and the material then flows into a, a hollow cavity that is being that is being closed uh, by a hydraulic a cylinder uh, and basically it has all the ingredients of an injection molding machine except it's a piston or a syringe that pushes it in and the melting really was the biggest uh, the biggest issue at the time. Uh, so uh, uh, this type of machine continued uh, being used. That was a, a very common machine. A piston pushed the material into a hollow cavity. Here's another patent. I found this one really cool because it's a 1904 patent from uh, Gaylor. I have the patent numbers there. And if somebody wants a copy of this presentation, I can send it to Lindsay and send it to you if you're interested in patents. Um, but this one here is really the first hybrid uh, injection molded hybrid structure, and, and it's to make amber parts. So amber, which is a natural material, can be processed at processing conditions very similar to polystyrene. It can be molten down and injected into cavities, um, and, but amber is relatively brittle, and so this person, a Gaylord, uh, actually uh, uh, made parts out of amber that were reinforced with metal inserts and that's why I, I refer here to as a hybrid structure metal plastic one so this pin in the center uh, is is a reinforcing part that stays in the center of the of, of the part so i mean and, and of course hybrid structures nowadays are really in in the auto industry where we combine sheet metal and and, and plastic ribs etc so anyways 1904 there is already a patent uh, that discusses uh, hybrid uh, structures um, and so uh, then uh, in 1931, there is this patent by Buchholz, and this now starts resembling more and more the injection molding machine, how the mold opens and closes uh, um, with a clamping unit, the injection unit, um, etc. So you can kind of see it there, the mold opens up, you eject the part, there's the ejector pins, uh, so it starts it starts um, uh, now resembling a lot more uh, like a machine. Now, the only thing that is missing is the plasticating unit. That still was a problem. Uh, and so one of the solutions uh, was to have the torpedo type system. This is a 1932 patent and drawing. So there is this metal torpedo that is heated in the center to give more surface area. So instead of, and already actually, if you look at back at the Hyatt patent, it already has those pins and stuff that kind of creates smaller spaces uh, to be able to transfer the heat. Remember the time uh, to uh, to heat something up and melt it is proportional to the thickness squared, right? So if you reduce a thickness or a space to half, you reduce the time to a quarter. Um, and so, 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 so that really is what people were thinking at the time. And so that's why this, this torpedo here reduces the space, makes the, the piston still pushes the material through and it melts the material as it is, as it is injected. And these torpedo machines were used way into the 50s. In fact, even there was a machine that was purchased in the early 80s, a small injection molding machine uh, that what I taught uh, polymer processing here in the, in, in the late 80s, early 90s, that was a piston type machine with a little torpedo in, in, in the center. It was a little teeny tiny vertical machine made by some unknown company in, in, uh, in Chicago uh, at the time. So that still existed. So, but then people started thinking about it. And so the, the screw-based injection molding machine had a history of its own. So there was a man named Hans Decker. Hans Decker uh, was an engineer uh, for, uh, for, for the, um, for the Paul Troister machine fabric. If you don't know Paul uh, Troister machine, it's, it's, a, it's a rubber processing uh, machine. In fact, uh, uh, distant cousins of mine actually uh, are the ones that uh, own and run the company still. Uh, and and then there they actually had extruders that would extrude natu uh, natural rubber. They also made calen calendars and, uh, and, and and other equipment. But um, Hans Decker uh, the, uh, wrote a paper, an internal paper at Toys that was called the Spritzmaschine or the injection machine. 
And basically what he did is he used this plasticating screw and put it in front of a mold and the screw would turn. And as the screw turned, instead of extruding the material out, it would inject it through a runner system into a cavity. Uh, but as you can imagine, uh, the screw uh, would generate only a certain amount of pressure. And of course, the pressure it generates is proportional to the resistance uh, of it. In, but you can't generate enough pressures and inject the material fast enough into the cavity. The, most the more restrictive, obviously, the slower you inject in. So you, you're restricted at making uh, parts that were relatively thick. And so that never went anywhere. And so, but around uh, Hans Decker uh, knew, had a friend, Hans Beck, who worked at BASF. And so, well, the uh, Paul Trösta um, uh, system was never really patented. Um, it was written up into an internal report. The, the Beck then started playing around with it. And he said, you know what, what we can do, the easiest thing is if the screw turns, and you don't let it go out in front of the extruder, but rather, rather you allow the screw to displace backwards. So you extrude into the front of the screw. That volume uh, then pushes uh, the screw backwards. And then once you have enough material sitting in front of the screw, you will use the screw like you use the, the, the piston with all the other injection molding machines and just push it into the cavity. And that way you can control the pressure or you can can control the speed at which you inject into the into the cavity. And so, but interestingly enough, if you look at this, he developed this in 1943, and there are records and notebooks and all of that, but they kept the lid on it all the way until 1952. It was in 1952 that actually they ended up patenting this. And the rest is history. Basically, this is a, a picture out of, out of Beck's patent, and it looks like today's injection molding machines. I mean, like the cartoon, when people start talking about injection molding and they show these really Mickey Mouse pictures of injection molding machines with the really screws that have a much larger diameter than they really have and all of that. Well, uh, that's what it, it, it kind of looks like this drawing here from the patent of, uh, of 1952. And actually his drawings in 1943 look exactly the same. Uh, so, and so at this point, basically, I mean, you can now continue talking about in developments and electric machines and, and, uh, and hybrid machines and all of that. And I'm sure you'll hear about all of those advances uh, this week. And so that's really not my, uh, um, my task today. So the question is, what's missing here still? And what is missing is understanding the process, uh, the plasticating, uh, the injecting into the cavity, the mold filling, uh, 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 dead spots inside or air entrapments, filling patterns, uh, uh, short shots, and all of that. And, and all of that, either you can play around with it and do things by trial and error and eventually figure it out, or you understand the physics that stands uh, behind it. And so, and so you can probably trace back most of the science development that happened, uh, or the first little science developments that happened, started in around 1974. And people were doing work on that, don't get me wrong, but, but, but organized center for injection molding really was the Cornell injection molding program, which was started by Professor K.K. Wang, which is the one I hold the professorship from here in Madison. Why do I have a K.K. Wang professorship? Is because K.K. Wang got his PhD uh, here in, in, in Madison, Wisconsin in 1972. After he finished his PhD, he went to Cornell and started the Cornell Injection Molding Program. There were several names like Heber and Chen uh, and Professor Stevenson, Jim Stevenson, uh, who later worked in industry. Some of you may have heard he passed away recently. Uh, Jim Stevenson also got his PhD here in Madison in 1970 uh, under Professor Bob Bird. K.K. Wayne got it in mechanical engineering under, under, under um, uh, uh, Professor Wu, Sam Wu. Uh, and you can see there on the left-hand side is the first report uh, from 1974. And then, and then there's a second report there on the, on the left-hand side from 1975. Every year, one of these would come out for the next 15 years. It was always a real treat uh, to get these, uh, um, uh, Professor Tucker would get them and we would, as graduate students, all read them when we were at Illinois. Uh, and I actually have the original ones. You can see the stand there from the Cornell Injection Molding Program. KK Wang gave them to me when I became the first um, the first um, uh, prof KK and Cindy Wang professor here in Madison. He donated a bunch of money after um, they sold the company 
and a sea mold, uh, which is another story. And I'm sure uh, people don't probably don't want me to talk about how that happened. Uh, that's it for another talk. Uh, litigations and patents and all of that. That's kind of an interesting, an interesting area. Uh, Jim Stevenson was one person that worked there and he developed something that was called the radial flow method. So basically you can assume a part to be a disc and you can project the disc and find different uh, pressures to inject material, find different uh, forces to inject materials for the clamping force and do predictions. Uh, and you can use nomograms or, or dimensionless graphs to be able to predict it. So you take a part, you lay it flat, you find a, you find a, a, a different radii and you are able to predict uh, to predict uh, relatively accurately uh, how, what, how much pressure you will need for different speeds of injection and how much and, and what um, um, uh, uh, what clamping force you're going to have to have. Uh, and so uh, people were watching at the time. Of course, there were other people doing work. And one of the people uh, paying attention was Colin Austin, uh, who I met uh, at, a, at, a, at the Antec conference. I think it was the one in Dallas. He presented there in Dallas and, and, and we ch sat down and, and chatted with him and uh, Professor Tucker. <clears throat> Basically, what he did, <clears throat> and it's very similar. If you can see the picture on the, on the right-hand side, and I apologize for the blurriness, but he basically re re replaced um, uh, the a part using different little discs and uh, and strips uh, and those discs and the interfaces between the different strips and discs um, are pressures that are unknown and so there are all these unknown pressures it's a linear um, uh, uh, set of equations that you solve, you solve for the pressures, you find for the flow rate between the different strips, and you can then see how a flow front advances, which is the part that fills last. Uh, and so and, and so you can then predict mold filling, predict pressures, and predict for more complex shapes uh, where, St where Stevenson, Jim Stevenson's technique um, uh, falls, falls apart. And he created then the first uh, commercial software, um, uh, Moldflow, which was created in 1978. Uh, the Cornell Injection Molding Program uh, continued their work. Uh, and by 1986, uh, they had, and there were other developments in 75, um, uh, uh, Zehef Tadmor had developed a flow analysis network where you replace the part with a, with a finite difference grid. Um, uh, which were just little square uh, uh, spaces. And it, basically it's like a control volume uh, that is either empty or is full or is partially full. Well, uh, K.K. Wang and his uh, graduate student, V.W. Wang, extended that and developed a control volume approach uh, for injection molding using triangles. At Illinois, uh, my PhD thesis was the control volume approach for compression molding. And we developed with Professor Tucker uh, with triangles and uh, and uh, four noted uh, elements, which also work, but eventually four noted elements were dropped from uh, this type of work. Here you can see the first actually a simulation uh, uh, experimental filling pattern and a control volume approach a filling pattern um, uh, for an injection molded part. Uh, you can see those little black dots in the finite element mesh. That's where pressure transducers were in the mold. You can see the filling pattern, how they had short shots and were able then to superpose the short shots with the simulated uh, filling patterns. And by 1986, they were really able to really accurately predict um, the filling patterns uh, in injection molded. The parts. Uh, here are the, the those are the pressure transducers, little, little black dots with the pressure transducers. You can see the, the dots there uh, is, is the measurement and the lines uh, are uh, the prediction. And you can see you can relatively well predict pressures inside of the cavity, which then uh, consequently you can also predict clamping forces. And so they started a, a company called C Mold uh, and C Mold and Mold Flow at the time basically were the leaders um, in, in, in the field. Um, eventually, uh, uh, Mold Flow uh, purchased a, a C Mold, became uh, one company, uh, and other companies came out. Uh, for example, Moldex 3D. Uh, this is, I mean, this is kind of the state of the art. We have this part right here, this mold filling. Uh, a three-dimensional mold filling simulation. They all have basically a similar similar aspects, and I'm not going to advertise uh, for, for any of them here. But you can do all kinds of things. You can predict fiber orientations, fiber length distributions, fiber density distributions. 
and so a lot of them, the, the models uh, for fiber orientation and fiber length distribution also came out of Tucker's group, the group where I got my, my PhD. And that's really why Chuck Tucker was interested in simulating flow. Uh, and he chose compression molding, SMC, uh, as the as the process because you had these very long fibers that and there was a basically a two dimensional fiber orientation distribution and injection molding is a lot more complex. It's three dimensional. They develop uh, the, the tensors. Uh, so so the, the the what you see there is a plot of of A one one A two two A three three, which are the diagonals orientation tens, tensors, which were developed by uh, uh, Suresh Advani, who was my office mate at the time in in Illinois, who also is the one uh, that uh, introduced me to my wife. So I'm eternally grateful to him uh, for, of course, introducing me to Diane and, of course, also for his uh, orientation at tensors. And so uh, with simulation, that's where I end uh, because it, it, it's still open. We still we are predicting now um, uh, fiber length. Fiber length we can handle fairly well. Fiber orientation can be handled fairly well. All the uh, uh, simulation uh, programs can can actually predict that. Uh, one of the things we can't really handle very well yet there are models uh, to predict fiber density distribution, and and I personally think the physics behind it is not well understood. Sometimes you predict it well, sometimes you don't. I mean, it's predicted by fiber migration or particle migration, but there are other things involved in fiber density distribution. So there's still things to be solved. Research continues. And I'm sure that that uh, amazing uh, injection molding machine uh, uh, that will be here someday with very, very low energy consumption, everything uh, has probably not been invented yet. So who knows what's there to come? It's kind of exciting. So thanks for letting me present this today. Thanks for inviting me, Lindsay. Oh, thanks, Tim. That was uh, awesome. I love hearing the history of all that. And I love, you know, we, we hear that the cellulosics, the billiard ball story, um, you know, the Penn State program, we hear that right off the bat. And it's, um, it's cool to, you know, get the details filled in on that. Um, and also amber can be run like polystyrene. Who knew? Um, <laughs> Well, thank you so much for coming this morning. Um, this was awesome. I loved every second of it. I will probably watch it at least two more times to see what else I can pick out of there. Um, and uh, we appreciate you. <laughs>